Uh, so I'm. My name is Meredith Rose. Uh, I work at a group called Public Knowledge. We are a. Okay, there we go. Um, so Public Knowledge is a consumer advocacy organization in Washington D.C. and we do a lot of digital consumer rights. So we do a lot of telecom, a lot of intellectual property, a lot of copyright stuff. Um, and my focus is on a combination of telecom and uh, fandom and how copyright law applies to fandom. So I could talk about this for hours. I will try not to. Well, they all leave after one hour. Yeah, there you go. Whether we're still talking or not, that's the rule. Oh, go ahead. Okay, I'm Courtney Lytle. I'm an attorney here in Atlanta. I practice intellectual property law and entrepreneurship as a general rule. I used to be with a big firm. I got better. Um, <laughs> I teach part-time at Emory Law School, so I'm going to be starting us out with the lecture mode part of it because that's what I do, and in the morning, that's the default setting. So that's what I'll be doing in a moment. Um, and okay, um, I'm Erica Farmer. I'm actually a legal anthropologist, so I'm trained both as a lawyer and an anthropologist, which means I'm kind of weird and quirky. Um, I work on cultural issues and intellectual property and heritage issues. So, um, yeah, so lots of weird, quirky things about that. Cool. Um, so, yeah, do you want to start off with? Sure. We're going to start with a little bit of an overview of intellectual property. Okay. Um, we're going to start with a little bit of just an overview of intellectual property. Intellectual property is the stuff we're here to talk about. It's copyrights, trademarks, those kinds of things. And there's three basic types. Four if you count trade secrets, but if we're talking about fan fiction and cosplay, there's no secrets. Um, so that one doesn't count. The next one that doesn't count is patents. Patents are the science-y things. Um, Y'all do talk about them in this panel, or in this track, but not in this panel. Patents are the inventions, they're the vaccines, they're the medicines, they're the hardcore science things. Um, we're not talking about that either. There are design patents, but that's not something that's really going to apply into costuming as a general rule either. So patents we're also rather setting aside. Um, then we've got trademarks and copyright. Trademarks, I'm not holding a trademarked beverage this morning, which is very strange. Someone is. Someone has a can or a bottle. Hold it up. There we go. Dasani. Yay. Um, made by the home team, Coca-Cola. When you buy that bottle with the blue label, with the label, it, with the nice little letters on it, or a red can with a white swoosh, you know what you're getting. It's the trademark that tells you that. Trademark is actually, in spite of what you know, Disney and Coke tend to think, trademark is actually about you guys, not about them. Trademark is so when you purchase something, you know what it is. It's really a consumer protection act at its heart. There are variations, there are ways that it's used that aren't necessarily all about you. But we like to say that because it's something that sounds good when we start the talk out. So trademark really is the consumer protection thing. It's so that it identifies the source of goods and services. Um, like I said, mostly it's the brand names that we know. So you know when you're buying a Samsung refrigerator and or phone, which I still don't quite get how I have one of each in my house, but they're apparently very clever. Um, I know that it's coming from those nice guys who will come out to my house and fix it. Um, and I know what I'm getting in theory. That's all a trademark really is. The companies register their names, they register their logos, they register their um, slogans. And relevant here, you can register some of your you know, Mickey Mouse, Superman level kinds of characters. So that sometimes comes into both a fan fiction and a cosplay level. Copyright is the real heart and soul of what we're talking about. Copyright is the intellectual property that protects all the artsy stuff. It's your books, it's your paintings, it's your songs, it's your carpet design. Um, it's a number of, the, it's anything like that that is artsy. And it occur. you don't have to register your copyright. I always tell you if you've created something that you actually care about, you should. But registration is automatic by virtue of fixing it in a tangible medium, which means writing it down or carving it in stone or you know, making it real, not just inside your head. Um, inside your head, you're still protected by trade secrets because no one knows what's inside your head. But you're really protected only by your skull. When you actually write it down or draw it or whatever it is to make it real, Copyright law attaches automatically. Um, I say this is new, but it really isn't. It's since the 70s, but people still have old ideas in their heads. And it happens automatically, however, if you want to really protect it, if you ever have to sue to protect your copyright, you're going to need to register it. So if you've written something or created something that you really care about, go and register it. You don't need one of us to register it. You can totally do it yourself. Copyright.gov, 35 bucks, a simple form, you're good to go. So register the stuff you care about, but you do not technically have to, nor do you have to put the little C on it with a circle and stuff after that. That's no longer required. But again, I tell people, if, unless it's going to cause 
horrible artistic damage to the integrity of your product, put the silly C with a circle on it because it lets people know that you are indeed intending to protect it. If you're not intending to protect it, you can use a Creative Commons version of that symbol and you can show people what they are allowed to use. But the more you can tell people what you want them to be able to do with it, the less likely at least the unintending thieves will steal from you. Intentional thieves, yeah, they're going to steal from you anyway. Um, it's kind of like locking your car. Keeps honest people honest and lets them know what you do and do not want them to be able to take. I leave my car door open a lot, hoping they'll steal my radio because it broke. Um, and I think it would be really funny to let them swipe the radio and then go, ah, oh, shit. Um, <laughs> that's just me. Um, a couple of things copyright does not cover. Um, one of them is facts. So if you are writing a history text or something like that, your, the facts and, that are in your book are not protected. Copyright's about the expression of ideas and it's about your expression. It's not about the underlying ideas. If there's any function to what you're making or what you're creating, that also is not protected. So for instance, although this carpet design, hypothetically, not that carpet design ever comes up at Dragon Con, Marriott, um, <coughs> Carpet design, the, fat, the design in the fabric, and sometimes designs of fabrics like this actually can be protected by copyright, but the floor covering is not. That's functional. So the act of being a carpet is not a copyright thing. The lovely colorful pattern um, is indeed a protected design, as was the one that we all knew and loved over at the Marriott. Um, that in fact, I mean, I think most of y'all know the Carpet Ninja story. Um, they, the folks who got the copies of it that they were making into their outfits and they're expanding every year. The carpet is gone, but the cult of the carpet lives on. I don't think this carpet's going to inspire its own fandom. I'm just saying. So things that are functional like, oh, I don't know, hypothetically clothes or costumes are, as a general rule, not covered by copyright because copyright does not cover function. There are concepts about how you can separate form from function. If you have a useful article, we look for conceptual or physical separability, we call it, meaning can I look at this and see both form and function? This is really just a picture. Um, yeah, it's shaped like that. It has a lovely handle, but the point of the handle is to pick it up, not to make it artistic. It's an aesthetically pleasing water pitcher, I suppose, but nothing really exciting about this. Um, so anything that is functional is not going to be covered by copyright. And the general rule, like I said, is that fashion and clothes, no matter how intricate or exciting, are not covered by copyright. And I think that some of y'all are going to talk about <laughs> why that's wrong, how they're trying to change it, and what's <sighs> going on with the current state of the law, but the default rule is Sorry, um, it may be terribly artistic, but it ain't covered. And that's kind of the default setting for copyright law. Cool. Um, so sort of to piggyback on that, so um, I wanted to talk generally about uh, cosplay and fan fiction uh, in that order as two of the really big, as you know, the two topics that we named in the name of the panel, um, and two of the more relevant sort of fan activity uh, issues that come up a lot. Um, and I will preface this by saying that every kind of fan activity has its own particular set of issues when you start talking about copyright. Uh, and even within that, so fan art, um, like, you know, uh, the guys who do um, uh, OC Remix, who do like video game remix music, that's a different set of issues than fan fiction, which is a different set of issues than fan comics, which is a different set of issues than fan vidding, which is a different set of issues than LARPing, it just goes all the way down. Um, and part of that is because copyright generally attaches slightly different versions of rights depending on what you're doing, uh, depending on what the source material is. So there's going to be a difference in these issues. Um, for example, if you're cosplaying, if you're cosplaying a character that has never actually, if you have cosplaying a character that is actually, someone has physically made this garment before for the purposes of a costume for like a live action movie or a TV show. That's one thing. If you're making a real life version of um, Anakin Skywalker's outfit from Clone Wars, that's a different issue because no one's ever actually really made that in real life. So it's, it's got, you're basically making a real life version of a pictorial representation, which is how the courts refer to it. So I will preface this by saying, you can go down any number of avenues and it's such a highly fact specific thing that there's kind of, very often there's no solid yes or no on a lot of these things. Um, so as Courtney pointed out, generally there's this issue of separability. And I like to talk about it in terms of, if you think about lamps, this is like the old example. The Balinese dancer. Oh, Yay. God. 
Um, so if you think about, like, if you go to Ikea and you get this lamp in your dorm room and it's, you know, 25 bucks, it's five and a half feet tall, it's a metal pole with a light bulb attached to the top of it and maybe a shade. That's as functional as you're going to get. That has nothing on it that does not exist to provide you with light. Um, that is the entirety of its purpose. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the uh, end table lamp at your grandmother's house that's got the seashells inside of it and, like, maybe some cherubs attached to the outside and it's ugly, but it's more of an art piece than it is of a lamp. Um, and so, you know, intuitively we kind of look at that and go, one of these has got creative stuff and the other one doesn't really, and how do we actually put into words what the test is to figure out where the functionality ends and the creativity begins? Um, and there's a lot of tests. This is the problem. There are 10 different tests for this right now, depending on what court you're in. Uh, so depending on what court you're in, you can get very different responses for the exact same thing. Uh, which is a problem, and the Supreme Court is going to be dealing with this, but I'll talk about that later. Um, and so the idea is, as Courtney mentioned, courts have generally bent over backwards to say that clothing is always functional. No matter what it looks like, it's always going to be functional. Now, if you've got like a print on a t-shirt, if you print like the Shepherd Fairy Hope poster on a t-shirt, that can still, the, maybe this is a bad <laughs> example because this one's come up a lot. Um, but that picture is still going to be copyrightable, but you can't copyright the t-shirt itself, if that makes any sense. So, like, the, the object itself cannot be copyrighted. The expression on the t-shirt in and of itself can be. But courts have really bent over backwards to say, like, eh, they're not comfortable with it. Part of this is because Congress has been approached a bunch of times over the last century with people saying, we need fashion copyright. And Congress has always said, eh, we're not comfortable with this. Partly because the fashion industry does fine without it. Uh, and partly because, frankly, a lot of the fashion industry depends on there being no fashion copyright. So your H&Ms, your Forever 21s, their entire business model is we see something on the runway, we turn around, we make a cheap version of it, and we sell it the next week. Um, and so that's a, that's a multi-billion dollar industry right there. <laughs> and, that exists. and they have lobbyists. And they have lobbyists. Um, more effective lobbyists than Versace does, which is surprising and refreshing occasionally. Um, so, you know, it's gotten to the point where there's a really famous case about the arrangement of sequins on a prom dress. And the court was looking at this, and someone sued and said, you use the exact same patterns of sequins. And it was a very specific kind of, I don't know if it was like a swan or something, but it was something that was just like very specific pattern. Someone copied the exact pattern down to the sequin placement. And the court said, well, we think that the sequin placement is functional because it tells us that it's a prom dress. So that's the degree to which courts are like, we really are not going to touch this with a 20-foot pole. Like, they don't want to get anywhere near it. Um, now, the case that has been coming up a lot, and if you guys follow the cosplay sort of news scene at all, you've probably heard about this. Uh, it's called Star Athletica versus Varsity Brands. It's going up to the Supreme Court. Ironically, it's being argued on Halloween morning, which oh, nice. I love, and I'm annoyed because I wrote a brief for it, so I have to sit in the room in a suit on Halloween morning. It's your lawyer costume. It's my lawyer cosplay, exactly. Um, <laughs> this is my grown-up cosplay. You know, right? Um, I am... I have, I have very seriously tried to get the 501st Legion to come to the steps of the Supreme Court for that argument, <laughs> just because I want that photo op so badly. Um, and the background on this case is it's between a couple of companies that make cheerleader uniforms. And the like, particular details of the case are kind of wacky, because it's, it's actually this David and Goliath story. Varsity Brains is like, has cornered the market on the cheer industry. They run the like national cheerleading competitions. They're kind of this giant corporate behemoth that's ter terrifying. They've knocked out all their competition by either suing them or buying them. And this little startup, Star Athletica, comes in and they start selling cheerleading uniforms. And then Varsity goes around and goes, uh, 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 your cheerleading uniforms, that V shape in that color looks too much like ours. That's infringing our copyright. And this goes through, this has gone through so much litigation and it got to the point where I think it was the Sixth Circuit. The Sixth Circuit was looking at this test about how do you suss out what's functional and what's decorative. And they were like, well, we have nine different tests. We don't like any of them. We're going to make a tenth. To which everyone was just like, you're kidding me. Um, appeal to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's going to hear it. And so the question on a very legalistic academic level is, how do you, how do you suss these two things out? Um, you know, PK got involved in this because... We work a lot with fan communities, and depending on how this comes down, it could they could adopt a test that either could be really good or really bad for costuming. Um, now, costuming, it's a little bit different when you're talking about things that are actually clothing versus a stormtrooper outfit. Um, clothing is functional. Its function is to protect your body and to keep you warm. Uh, a stormtrooper outfit is not functional. Um, it is clanky, and it does not protect you from blaster fire, as we have found. Um, 
and so the 501st would like to fight with me on this one, but I'm right. Um, and so, you know... If they shot at you, they'd miss, so it's okay. Exactly. <laughs> I was trying to get them to sign onto a brief, and they were like, I don't know if we want to do that, and my friend's joke was the stormtroopers never know what to aim for. <laughs> um, which is, like, uh, above my desk on the sticky note now. Um, but yeah, so, again, and when you deal with things like, basically, armor is closer to a prop than it is to clothing by a lot of metrics. Um, so, yeah, a lot of this is, like, uh, there is no good answer. Um, the, the solid practical answer is people generally don't come after cosplayers. <laughs> like, as, as a general rule, especially if you're not, like, selling things. Um, if you're making props and selling them, be very careful of whose product you're making into a prop. Try not to make Disney props. As a general rule, try not to make Nintendo props. Those are the two big ones that you kind of want to stay away from. Um, okay, so fanfic. This is shifting gears here. Fanfic is the other big one. Fanfic has its own sort of interesting set of questions. As I said earlier, everything's got different angles that you take on it. Um, fanfic is interesting because when you think about it, you're working in words. So like images, visual representations of characters are one thing. They're a lot more clear cut. Words are a little bit vaguer, and so the real question is, like, can you copyright the characters from a story? Can you get a copyright on Harry Potter? Can you get a copyright on Padme Amidala? Um, the answer is probably, and maybe not in that order. Uh, don't tell Disney I said that. But um, So the test is, it's interesting, because you can, you can uh, copyright is intended to attach to the expression of an idea. Um, an archetype of a character is just an idea. Like, it's not a particularly unique character. And so courts have kind of wrangled with this a little bit, especially over the last century. The two really big cases about this actually involve Sam Spade, the Dash Hammett character, uh, and Rocky Balboa, weirdly enough. Um, they make very strange bedfellows. But there's kind of two different ways the courts look at this. One is this, it's called sufficiently delineated, which is basically, you know, how far away from an archetype is your character? How well fleshed out are they? Um, if you are, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna rip on Star Wars here because I love it and it's garbage and that's fine. Um, but there was, a, there was a meme going around right after episode three came out, where there was a video and they went around and they said, all right, without naming the character, without using their name, uh, their physical appearance or their job, or it's their name, their relationship to other characters or their job, describe these given characters. And they did with characters in the original trilogy and Han Solo is like, you know, the dashing rogue with a heart of gold and blah, blah, blah. And then they got to Padme and no one could say anything. <laughs> she, they were just like, she's there? The like, <laughs> yeah, she's, she's the, the woman. Yeah. Um, Look, the girl. And so, you know, that's kind of the idea of like a sufficiently delineated, like how fleshed out is your character? Is it, could you replace it with basically another character that fills the same, has the same job? And if you could tell basically the same story, then that's not very well delineated. Um, the other way that some courts look at it, and it depends on what court you're in, because these are all circuit splits, um, is this concept called the story being told. And the story being told is kind of related. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with that joke about a lot of female characters. You think about how essential they are to a story, and if they can be replaced with a sexy lamp, then they're really poorly written characters. Um, that's, the sexy lamp is basically the story being told test. Um, and the idea being, if you could take this character out and replace them with just some random schmo off the street and get basically the same story, then they're not the story being told. They're really not that important. Sam Spade, weirdly enough, is actually under this test. Uh, the Maltese Falcon could have been replaced with any schmo under this test. Uh, meanwhile, Rocky Balboa is apparently very important to his story. <laughs> so, um, it's, yeah, it's kind of funny. I mean, like, the upshot of this and the one I use is someone who really and I say this with love, someone who really does not pass the story being told test is Neo from The Matrix. <laughs> you could take some random guy off the street and as long as you chose the right pill, you pretty much have the same movie. Um, and so that's kind of how you think about uh, whether characters can be copyrighted. Now, as far as how this applies to fanfic, that's basically what you're borrowing in these characters. So there is an argument that like fan fiction could possibly be infringing depending on what the strength is of the particular character that you're doing, but at the same time, fan fiction is almost definitely a fair use. Um, the fair use is itself kind of a wacky topic. There's like four different criteria to figure out whether something is fair use. And two of them, which are the ones that, I bring them up because they're the ones that get brought up the most. It's, they're not more important than anyone else. All four are equally weighted. Um, but the ones that get brought up the most are whether you're making money off of it. So don't sell your fanfic, rule one, um, unless you're, 
unless you write Fifty Shades of Grey and then you change all the names and then you sell your fanfic. Um, and how how much of the the original work that you borrow and how transformative it is. So if any of you are familiar with the Organization for Transformative Works, which are the people who host AO3, um, they're amazing. We work with them a lot. I love them a lot. Um, always, everyone donate to OTW. They're great. Um, and transformativeness is the idea. And it's funny because some fanfics are way more transformative than others. It exists on a scale. So like on one end, you have people who do novelizations. And I say this, again, I don't think there's anything wrong with this, but there are people who do novelizations of their playthrough of like Dragon Age Inquisition where it's basically they rewrite the game, including the dialogue, depending on their choice tree. And then you have like the coffee shop AU on the other end, um, <laughs> in which you basically take the idea of the characters and the names and like their personality traits and you transpose them into somewhere they don't belong. Um, so it exists kind of on a spectrum. So all of this is a very complicated and long-winded way of saying there's a lot of different stuff that goes into this. Um, I would in fact talk about this for like three hours. I'm actually writing a book on this in my very vanishing spare time. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. So, I will pass it off to Eric. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know. Are we just going to ignore whatever Cliff was going to talk about, I guess? I, I don't even know what it was. There's something about the DMCA, but I actually yeah, I don't wasn't actually entirely sure what it was. was. <laughs> okay. Either, so All right. Well, we I'm going to just talk about... about you said there were four things, and you had making money and transporting Oh, what the other the things for the fair use? Uh, the other two are the nature of the borrowing and the amount. Okay. And the nature of the underlying work. And the nature of the underlying work. Yeah, so the nature, I guess the nature of the borrowing and the amount are really the same factor, and then the nature of the underlying work. Nature of the use, nature of the work, amount used, and effect on the marketing for. Mm-hmm. And I guess I'm going to just kind of inject a little bit of bits and pieces throughout some of the other stuff that they were talking about, just to kind of maybe muddy the waters even further, <laughs> because that's kind of what I do, because I'm an academic. Um, so um, one of the things that's kind of key to the way that copyright works and why people, I, I work, I'm an anthropologist, and so a lot of times when I'm talking to other anthropologists, they'll be like, yeah, so why can't we just get rid of all this copyright stuff or all this property law stuff, because it's not, you know, because it's oppressing people or the corporations are using it or whatever, and it's like, that'd be great, except for there's a lot of history and context to why the rules are the way they are. Um, and so I've spent a lot of time thinking kind of about why some of the rules are complicated for other communities that might be trying to engage with the IP system or the property right system. Um, so one of the things that's really kind of quirky about copyright law is that it's really tied to this idea of the romantic author. So the romantic author is that, you know, it's that guy and it is a guy. Um, uh, a lot of the copyright actually came out of like famous authors in Europe trying to protect their work. So Victor Hugo was really involved in European copyright law, for example. Um, so the romantic author is this guy who, you know, surely like a vision of genius comes to him and he writes this magical book and, you know, and it has nothing to do with, it, with anything that came before him and it's all this kind of pristine thing and he creates it. And so we create copyright law to protect his genius so that he keeps writing wonderful books like this. And the entire premise of the way copyright rights sit on things comes from the fact that we have this imaginary guy who wrote this imaginary book back in the day. And as a practical matter, it's not how people write books anymore. And it's and we've never been without history. We've never been without context. And so the idea of um, a copyright law that's really based on this idea of individual genius coming out of nowhere and not playing off of things that existed before is something that you actually see a lot of debate about as you kind of get into more nuanced versions of what copyright's doing today versus what copyright might have been doing a century ago or two centuries ago. Um, And so one of the things that makes that really complicated is when you try to expand copyright onto new kinds of objects. So when you're talking about copywriting computer programs and things like that, you know, they're trying to compare it to the phone book or a database. And it's like, it's none of those things. And so the idea of being able to broaden intellectual property has been something that IP has been fighting with basically since IP started. Um, the same thing happened when music got kind of brought into the fold. So, you know, like when you look at all those strange like music video st- shows and there's like record of the year and recording of the year and like all the different parts, that's because IP is not built around music either. It's built around that guy with the book that he made up out of his head. And so when you're trying to spread it out and put it onto something like music, you've got people copywriting like the words of the music and the tune of the music and then all the things and they're all separate because it's complicated and kind of silly. Um, So, you know, other things that really don't kind of fall into the classic model of what copyright is, is group rights or collaborations. So um, if you're looking at things that are maybe building off folklore, um, you can't copyright folklore generally because the rules are set around this individual thing. So if you've got centuries of history and you can't prove it's brand new and original at the moment that you're copywriting it, it actually 
negates that. So that there are some equities around that if you're thinking about traditional communities, for example. So if you're writing something based on, say, the mythology of a culture that you've read about in a book somewhere, like the National Geographic or you know myths of some culture, like that stuff, there has been a move where those communities are sometimes trying to think about how to protect that information from being appropriated, usually through corporate means or kind of insensitive usage of their um, cultural property. But that's one of the things that I've worked on, which has been a little bit complicated when you're thinking about like, okay, so folklore. So just the anthropological pitch here is like, try to be culturally sensitive if you're using that kind of stuff because they can't protect themselves either. Um, and so it's just something to think about um, that's kind of built into how things work. Um, and yeah, everyone's been talking about the idea expression distinction like through all the discussions here. And again, that's the, you can protect the thing that you make out of your idea, but your idea itself is not what's getting protected. I also really like Sen's Affair. Um, yeah. because Affair, the pirate it was, was the pirate with a parrot on his shoulder is like um, I, mine examples. was the starving artist eating bread off the street um, nice. so basically you can't protect if it's something that when you think of this kind of a character that's what they always do an adventurer you, walks into a pub a young boy saves the world you know pirates are swashbuckling Every and doing stuff made. yeah so basically <laughs> that kind of stuff no matter how much people want to protect it under a copyright law you just can't do it because it's like how can you have a pirate that's not off being you know piratey yeah. um so you know that I, and i think that plays in a lot into um what we were talking about earlier about the um you know kind of these how specific to the role of the character is what's going on. I wanted to weigh in a little bit with what you're talking about, kind of the heritage of copyright law. Mm -hmm. Some of what Erica was saying is absolutely correct about how English law was developing. The um, U.S. law has a little bit of a different philosophy behind it. Um, the copyright is actually in the Constitution and was put there, to, uh, the idea behind it, now I'm not saying it's how it's applied now, but the concept and the philosophy behind American, U.S. copyright is to actually protect and create the public domain because the founding fathers recognized that most of art and it was sculpture and it, I mean music did count it was books and it was literature and it, you know, it was the good stuff but it was the crappy stuff too that was in large part in um, you know that era Europe was either you know commissioned by the church or commissioned by the nobles well we were now forming a country that was based on the theory that we wouldn't have a lot of either of those and they thought it was important to make sure that artists of all sorts were going to be protected and able to, in theory, survive so that they can create. And it wasn't the artist that they really cared about. It was the function of creation because they wanted there to be an increasing body of art and literature and science. It's patent counts in here in the same theory, same section of the Constitution. And so the concept was that we will give them a limited monopoly, a time during which they are the only ones who have the rights to their stuff, not because we're following a regular property idea. You know, um, this is mine because I bought it. That's tangible property. IP, in Europe, the concept's the same. It's my play because I put the effort into writing this play. That's not the nature of US copyright. This is kind of academic crap that we get interested in and other people don't, but um, the concept is that copyright exists to encourage the production of the public domain, and once something is out of that limited monopoly, once your copyright expires, and it says specifically that Congress can you know, give a monopoly for a limited time, then that work goes into the public domain and other people can freely use it. Um, we were talking about folklore and things like that. That's not covered by anyone's copyright, therefore it's part of the public domain, therefore people can draw from it freely. We can draw from Tolkien who drew from, you know, Wagner who drew from folklore. There's a mm -hmm. lot there, but the specific version of how Tolkien expressed those very old stories still belongs to his heirs. Um, the specific way of express that you express a very old story. I've told in a couple of my other panels, my mother has ex been exposed to exactly two pieces of science fiction. Um, I guess one's technically fancy. One was the first Star Wars movie, like the first one released, number whatever that was, four. Um, and then the first of the real, you yeah, know, um, <laughs> the Luke Skywalker one, first one yeah, she <laughs> went to that one. Um, and then she was at my house one Christmas sick and had already finished the books she bought, so she read Harry Potter. And she's like, oh my god, this is a complete knockoff of Star Wars. What? <laughs> and she identified the basic tropes. Young kid, doesn't know his heritage, dead parents, fights evil. Isn't the that just bad like a building's wears, <laughs> The bad guy wears a black cloak and his name starts with a V. I mean, it, I'm like, oh, that's a little scary. But... 
We yeah, recognize yeah. that every fantasy book ever written is very similar to that. And we don't see Star Wars and Harry Potter as similar. She saw the trope at the center of it as being the same. And well, that's, like, that's the part that's not protected. Yeah. And that's kind of one of the fun things of doing, you know, if I told you about a story with a hero who discovers he has mystical powers and finds a mentor and he has a call to adventure and then he meets like a tough as nails potential love interest and a lovable rogue sidekick, in some combination, I am either talking about Star Wars, I am talking about basically some combination of your companions in any of the Dragon Age games, I am talking about... Um, you know, arguably, you could go with like the Matrix. You could uh, this. You could go with essentially Harry Potter. Anything. Mm -hmm. um, every David Eddings book ever written. Every David. <laughs> I was just thinking of that. Um, every David Eddings. Most of the Wheel of Time. I mean, just. But we can, keep reading that story because we it's like the it. It's a hero's journey. It's if the you, monomyth, and if we you'll love keep it. writing it. We'll keep reading it because um, we like it. But yeah. it's the individual expression of it that's protected. That underlying boy, mentor, rogue, journey. You can't own that. The, uh, I think the best was, um, I was trying to think of, oh, so actually this, this is interesting. I just kind of wanted to piggyback on this. Um, and then we were talking about the way copyright works in the U S um, the way the copyright works in the U S is actually like really unique within the world. Um, as in like the concept of copyright sort of originally came from England and Europe's got, it's very different. So the way that, um, Europe looks at copyright. And I think a lot of people think about it this way in the U S because they, it's more natural. It's more natural. It's it's this idea of a moral right. You, this is your baby. You are its parent. You have the right to control how it enters the world, in what context, and how it is used once it enters the world. So a lot of European authors retain these things called moral rights, which is, you know, in its many manifestations allows you to control um, the ways in which it is used subsequent to its production. In the US, it's an economic right. You know, the, the clause of the constitution says to promote the progress of science and the useful arts, Secure, Congress shall secure to the, uh, for a limited time to the authors, uh, like a limited monopoly. Um, and it's basically, you have made something that the public will now enjoy. We will give you a period of time in which you can make money off of that, and no one else can make money off of that. And then after that, eh, people can do what they want. Um, do not try to explain this to Disney. It does not end well. Uh, <laughs> but Notice it's, that that right comes from the government. When she's talking right. about the European version, it's kind of a natural law thing. It's mine because I made it. Right. It's the sweat of my brow. We have absolutely forbidden that to be the justification in the United States. But the concept is the government's given you these rights, not they came from nature or from Though God. it is interesting, there's one exception to that, and that's Vera, which is the Visual Artist Rights Act. There's This is like the one place. It's such a weird hiccup. It's, it's the one place where there are moral rights in the United States, and that's basically for installation art. Um, and that's if you have, if you make a giant piece of installation art, you get to say you're not allowed. If someone wants to like knock it down or move it from its original location, you can say no. You have that right as an artist. But it's just this one particular area. It's just like one little pinprick in the law that's from like the mid '90s. Um, people keep arguing about whether we should have a moral right in the United States. It would uh, like I could talk about campaign music, like how political campaigns uh -huh. use music, and it would basically just like destroy the politic. <laughs> no. Republicans would never be able to play anything at their rallies if that came down um, because they just have a really bad track record of asking anyone if they can play their music. Um, so yeah, it's okay. It's a super broad and varied topic. Um, again, this is all like, obviously we could all just sit up here for hours and talk, but I think we should probably get some yeah, questions. We have one right there. So, um, on should take the, take the catch box so that oh, you record uh, people's questions. Okay. Um, on the uh, public domain, mm -hmm. I don't know if this is a rumor, an urban legend, but my understanding was that the woman who actually made the happy birthday song uh, nice. and that Love this case. someone constantly in her family after 100 years from my understanding has been uh, suing for copyright, and so you really can't sing "Happy Birthday" in public without paying someone. Yeah. So this is actually this just this, yeah. this case yeah. just wrapped up like in the last year. They're still fighting over the attorney's fees at this point. Yeah, but, but basically what happened was there was this like these two people came out and said, or the, someone wrote down what we know is the "Happy Birthday" song. And there was some like weird question about whether they had copyrighted it or that had passed off. So, and there was this whole big tangled litigation because this was from back in like the 1930s. 
Um, and so they were trying to find all this documentary evidence. And then it turns out, at the end of the day, the people who claimed they had, like, created it had not. And it was just, so we don't know who copyrighted it, who technically owns the rights. Whoever they are, we have no idea. So the court is basically like, congratulations, like, no one can come out and sue you. But so. for years it was protected by copyright, and that's why if you go to a restaurant and they sing happy birthday, it's kind of their own happy, happy birthday kind of waiter song. They mm -hmm. didn't want to sing it because, indeed, the people who said they owned but have since been ruled not to own the copyright to that song would charge the restaurant money for singing Happy Birthday. And this actually came up funny enough. The court case came because there was a pair of documentarians who were making a documentary about the song Happy Birthday, and they were not allowed to use the song in their movie about the song. And that was where the lawsuit came from. Um, and it was, yeah, it was great. Our entire office um, recorded ourselves singing Happy Birthday and put it on YouTube in nice. celebration of that video. And thinking like, what you gonna do now? Um, you don't own it, haha. -ha. Okay. So, um, yeah, the holder of the box yeah, she's answers the, box. The, next, the next question. Hi, um, my question is, uh, we see, we, we're kind of hearing a lot about you know, people getting cease and desist letters and things like that. And also on Tumblr, there's been a resurgence and kind of a history lesson about, you know, why do you put the thing on your fanfic that says, disclaimer, I don't own these characters. Mm. Um, and there was this big history lesson about, you know, the horror stories mm. of fanfic disappearing and people getting cease and desist letters. But there's never any discussion about what you should do when that happens. What do you do when you get a cease and desist letter from some great black entity? Uh, you contact Public Knowledge. My email is mrose at publicknowledge.org. Um, no, it's actually, no, it is interesting. Like, the history behind people, I mean, I have been writing fanfics since I was 13. And, like, all of my early stuff, now that I'm a lawyer, I like to think I know better, but I don't. Um, <laughs> But I, you know, they all had like disclaimer. I do not own Dragon Ball Z. Lol. Um, yeah. Like that somehow made a difference. And yeah, the answer no is it doesn't. Copyright intended. Like worst it, thing. Yeah. Ever. No, no copyright infringement intended. No one cares. It doesn't matter. What um, you it's like it's saying true. bless his heart after you just rip someone apart. It yeah. doesn't undo it, the insult. It does <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Same with if you post a vid on YouTube and you sit, like post the text of the fair use part of the statute underneath it in the description, that does not do anything. And fair use is also Sorry. like a defense. It's not like a proactive it's, thing. Well, actually, there's a fight about that right now. Okay. But, like, but um, like, at least traditionally. You know, it's a defense against an action for infringement. It's but there's the statute. Yeah. Um, she and I are going to take a very different take on this. She's going to defend you, and that's great. <laughs> I'm going to tell you if you want to stay out of trouble when you get the cease and desist, you better cease and desist. Probably should, Because yeah. at its heart, Fan fiction is infringement. Now, whether it's an allowed infringement mm -hmm. or not, at its heart, it's an infringement. Usually, content owners are smart enough to realize it's good for them, because if you guys are writing fan fiction, mm -hmm. you're getting you know, more and more excited about the fandom, and you'll buy their stuff, and they like that. Some of them are not that smart and enlightened and say, hey, you can't do that. Sometimes they say you can do it until you're getting too good at it, then we're going to make you stop. Um, an example I like to use is um, J.K. Rowling and her, you, you may have heard of her, she's written a few books. Um, she, she and Scholastic were always pretty cool about letting kids post all the stuff on their websites and their MySpace pages for a while. Um, and one boy posted a really well done encyclopedia of the entire Harry Potter universe. Mm -hmm. Well. And he wasn't yeah. charging for it. So charging for it usually makes your case worse and you're going to get in trouble more quickly. But this boy wasn't charging for it. He had just done this out of love for the characters. But that was something Scholastic wanted to do later, maybe. And they said, no, you can't be putting that up there. That's our world and that's our characters. You can't be do you, you're infringing. You've got to take it down because that's where they drew the line of what mm -hmm. they would let him do and not do. Right, because that's the, that's kind of the transformative prong a little bit, right? Like yeah, in and, terms well, of and it, it, it goes into the like how much are you competing with a market that they're either into or could conceivably want to enter into, which is part were, of the fair use analysis. So. Yeah, they weren't really worried about the fair use analysis. You do that when you're litigating with them. They right. were doing they were instinctively doing it though, I suppose, because mm -hmm. they said, no, we care about that because. We want to sell that later, and if you've given one away that might be better than ours, um, we can't sell one later. It's it's the reason you can't actually buy good quality um, lightsaber replicas of given characters is because Disney retains the right to put out basically like Ahsoka's lightsaber, and the only version in which they make it is a really crappy extendo toy. Uh, and you, you saw the lightsaber dealers, I guess ultra sabers that are down in the dealer room. They are all very slightly off of canon. Um, for purpose. because of reasons, yeah, because <laughs> so, of us, yeah, uh, because of sorry, laws. but the um, I had a thought and it just 
just escaped. <laughs> It'll come back. Later. Okay, we should probably move to the next question. Yep. Okay. Hi, and my question is uh, mostly for Erica, but you guys can weigh in. Um, uh, you were talking about folklore and stuff. I'm wondering how that relates to things that have like very, very intricate universes and mythos that have almost become mm -hmm. sort of its own folklore. Like you've got uh, like, let's say the DC Comics universe mm -hmm. and you've got um, like multiple different origin stories, but you've got kind of this uh, culture grown around it and, and multiple interpretations of the same characters. Like how would that, do, does that, do you see the bleeding over at all or becoming a related I'm, issue? I mean, what I've worked on has been a lot with indigenous rights. And so um, mm -hmm. one case that I actually teach about is Lego was putting out the Bionicle figures. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but they basically took a lot of Pol Polynesian folklore and kind of copyrighted it and kind of trademarked it into their little figures and things. And they had this whole web presence built around like actual traditional knowledge material that those cultures couldn't actually have protected themselves. And so what ultimately wound up happening was some websites got hacked because indigenous activists actually kind of went outside of the legal protections that would have happened. So that's kind of the part that I've worked on just as an anthropologist. Um, in terms of building your own mythology, I think maybe you probably could speak a little it's, more So about actually that. like copywriting a world apart from its characters is always a really interesting question uh, to which there is no good answer um, because frankly no one's brought it up in the courts yet. Um, that's how we figure a lot of this stuff out. Um, but you know, again, we were talking about characters and sort of the less fleshed out they are, the le the harder you're gonna have to fight to say that they're copyrighted, and the more fleshed out they are, the easier it is. So you know, on one end, you kind of have um, I don't even I can't even think of a good answer, but like you know, it, it's somewhere in the middle. You've got like Tolkien's Middle Earth, and then you've got like the Star Wars universe that's like bigger than any has any right to be, and then you you kind of get all the way down to like the DC and Marvel universes. So if I had to guess you'd probably, the farther and more intricate that universe came, ironically, and the closer it ended up looking like folklore because of it, ironically, probably the easier it would be to defend in court as something that in and of itself would be copyrighted. Right, and it's like, and that's kind of the opposite end of the equities of kind of what I've been talking right. about, because basically the more traditional knowledge you get, the more it wraps around to get to really t tied to kind of new, kind of new technologies and like people generating their own mythologies out of what's happening today, so. Yeah, I was going to open the panel by saying to the audience, thank you for coming in costume and cosplay because we take pictures and then we send it to, we send it to back to the owners and then we take a cut of the... <laughs> <laughs> of the for, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, we'll need we your social security money. numbers and your addresses. I'm just oh, kidding. We've got well, those. Uh, I mean, uh, Courtney may not like this question, but um, for, the, um, for the rest of you, one of the questions I asked in the description was, should laws be changed to allow nonprofit uh, fanfic and cosplay, regardless of the copyright owner's wishes? And that's a, that's a policy question. No, so. I, I, I'm not opposed to that. I, I, I'm the one who says, no, you really aren't allowed to do that. I don't necessarily say that it's right whether you're not yeah. allowed to mm -hmm. do that or not. But what I I'm, I'm the pragmatic one who says, I don't want to go to court. And if I'm writing fan fiction, when I get the cease and desist, I do, because I know what I've been doing is under our current law an infringement unless I can prove that it's a fair use, which takes people like her to prove to a judge that it is. Because mm -hmm. until you convince the judge it's a fair use, it technically isn't. And I don't want to go to court. It's not my kind of law. So the law as it stands means we can't. I don't know that that's the right way to be. I know that she can expand on that much more. But what the law is and what the law should be, I think, are very different questions. Mm -hmm. But we are living under what the law is. And what the law is means you got to be careful because if they sue you, it costs you a lot of money to defend yourself. Yeah. So it's interesting because this all kind of wraps in actually like what Erica was saying that like copyright laws, it's not only are we living with the copyright law we have, we're living with basically a new version of, or the a slightly evolved version of the copyright law we've had for 250 years now. Um, and even before that, if you want to go back to like the statute of Anne in England, mm -hmm. like we had this for a long time and it's really sprung up out of a very specific set of cultural norms that as we, you know, as Erica said, we apply it to things like software. Uh, you start to get into areas where it clearly was not designed for this. And oh, there's a lot functional. of- I'm sorry. As, there's a lot of lawyers. <laughs> the most common refrain in my office when we read a court opinion is, that's not how this works. That's not uh -huh. how any of this works. Right. Um, and it's, it's a common frustration. And so, you know, we're living right now as fans in like this kind of golden age um, detente 
really, between fans and, like, massive copyright interests like Disney, um, where we have this power of the internet. And there were a couple of years where, like, they really didn't know what to make of this. Um, you know, Marion Zimmer Bradley is kind of the ultimate story of, like, she's the one that people held up for a long time is, like, this is why authors don't like fanfic, because she... I don't know if any of you know the story, but, like, the story was that she was writing a book, and she actually edited a zine of, of fanfic of her own work. She loved fanfic. She was, like, super engaged with the community. Um, and she would occasionally, if she was working on a book, and she saw, a, like, a fanfic author that she really liked and had a plot that was kind of, like, similar to something she was working on or she wanted to incorporate, she would give them a co-writer credit or, like, a thanks in the beginning of the book. And they would get, she'd pay them for it, and this was, like, a big deal if you were a fanfic author. Like, yeah. Senpai noticed me. Awesome. Um, Someone real noticed me and liked me. Exactly. Yeah. And so this came to a head when she had one author who said she wanted not just the normal thanks that they normally get, but said, like, basically what you wrote for this book is basically stole my fanfic idea, and I want full co-authorship. <laughs> and she said no, and this is this was like huge, this was like a telenovela for fandom at the time. It was insane. Hell no. Um, and she basically stopped writing that series after this because it mm. was such a bad experience. She got so burned on it that she was just like, I can't. And now, you know, J.K. Rowling has a policy, never, ever reads Harry Potter fanfic. And the idea is like, if you stumble on something and then it ends up looking, it, you end up writing something that may kind of sort of maybe resemble, like they're actually, they're occasionally afraid of getting sued by fanfic authors, <laughs> like, which is a very weird thing to think about. But, you know, we kind of live in this golden age where, where they look at fandoms and they're like, hmm, free marketing, okay. And they just kind of let it happen, um, you know, within certain reasons. Like when you start making porn out of Overwatch characters, Blizzard's going to get upset, um, as they have usually. Just avoid the porn. Um, sorry, most of Ao3. Um, but yeah, I, it's it is weird. We we live in an era where like the there's a two way interaction between fans and creators in a way that copyright law was absolutely did not envision in any real way. Um, and so there's this interesting dichotomy between this is what the law says. And this is how people actually work, um, even on the company side of how these things work. So it's, it is really interesting. I think the law does need to be updated. I don't know what that would look like, realistically. Um, I have my like activist fever dream checklist of things I would love to be in there. Um, I would look fair use to be a rebuttable presumption. That's mm -hmm. my lawyer. That's my yeah, lawyer that's hat. Um, which is that if you Changing if you get sued, you assume it's fair use unless it's not. Unless you prove otherwise. Um, if basically like if someone sues you for fanfic, you'd be like what? prove that I'm doing something wrong with yeah, it. Yeah, and shifting defaults is a great It is a great way to do it. Um, I think that would be the big one. So, that's the that's my how it works now. If they sue you for infringement now, you have, they, to, you have to go you in have and prove. You have to prove that it's a fair use. All of the burdens on and, you. And you as prove. the tiny consumer now have to hire a lawyer who's good at copyright stuff, who's well-versed enough in fair use that they can go in and be like, well, here are the four factors in fair use. You have to make a convincing argument and fair use as much as I love it, is fundamentally a sniff test to courts. Um, it's very much, I'll know it when I see it, and they purposely keep it that way um, because they want it to be a case-by-case -case thing, which means that as a fan, I have no certainty about whether or not yeah. a judge is going to decide in my favor. Whereas if you may, flipped it around and you came in, the judge would have to assume that whatever you're doing is fair use and it would be up to Disney or Marvel to prove them wrong. So yeah, it kind of helps the little guy. In it would really help the little guy a lot. Well, that so would be my... hurt the little authors. Yeah, that's true. Not everyone little... who's own, who owns content is Disney. Stop and complicating so my narrative. <laughs> I like my it's version. my job. I'm here as the <laughs> Erica. <laughs> so, so Erica, are you gonna um, are you gonna break the deadlock between what the law? I mean, is honestly, I think um, this is kind of where I come down in terms of IP a lot because I feel like I'm I'm working on the weird backward side of this that comes back and hits where you guys are, and I think. Yeah, it would be fantastic to have another system that would make it okay. I think trying to shoehorn it into IP is perhaps a problem. Mm -hmm. I actually also work on geographical indications law, which is kind of the up and coming IP thing. And so they're trying to think about using that for um, traditional knowledge. So that's, if you know champagne has to come from France, it's the legal system that protects that. And so they're thinking about using that to protect some of the things that don't fall under regular IP. And so just talking to people about like, how do you expand from what we're used to using as IP to if we can kind of tinker with the system a little bit and we're actually at a point where we can start to think about what we want a system to look like how would we do that um, and so I think just from that kind of experience it seems like if you just shoehorn some more stuff I don't think it gets better I think you might need something that could run alongside IP rather than something that's exactly the same as what we have and we're just shifting all the things and hoping it works out okay or, or you can just or you can just you know 
kill it with fire and then start over again. But I feel like that would actually open to some really worse outcomes than what we've got right now. So yeah, I mean, and the system does stuff now. Like it does work for certain things. Exactly. It just doesn't work for this. It works and for some a lot other of things. things. It's so. also very open to abuse. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that you'll indulge me for a very short question and then a slightly longer one. The short one is, to your knowledge, has TV Tropes ever served as a resource in a uh, legal case? And the slightly longer one is, uh, if, if we feel that citizens in general haven't really uh, ever had a lot of input into how intellectual property works and we see the slow growth of the scope of intellectual property and we'd like to reverse that, either because we're IP abolitionists or because we would just prefer to have a much smaller scope of protections. Uh, what would you recommend that we do to serve that end? You should, you should join the public knowledge mailing list. Um, no, there's a bu so there's a bunch of, to answer your second question, there are a lot of groups that work on this in DC on the policy side. Um, there's, I mean, EFF is sort of like our more slightly more famous cousin. Um, they do a lot of stuff on copyright. They're based in San Francisco, um, but they do a lot of pro bono representation for some really wacky out there copyright stuff. Um, in wacky and out there in that I can't believe someone got sued for this kind of sense. Um, public Knowledge is another group. Um, the uh, uh, Open Technology Institute at New America, which is run by Kevin Bankston, who's actually going to be here at the 530 panel on um, how science fiction influences public policy. So there's, a, there's like a whole sort of nexus of groups that work on specifically pushing back against this sort of copyright creep in Creative a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, Creative Commons does a lot of great work. Wikimedia does a lot of great work. Um, research libraries, like your university research libraries are really active on a lot of this stuff. Um, the Internet Archive, Brewster Kale. Um, as far as the TV tropes question goes, no, but I really want to see this now. <laughs> um, yeah. I would love to see TV tropes brought up as an, as a piece of evidence and that like no yeah. there's girls with guns is definitely just a trope <laughs> like so i have a question about fan fiction and patreon mm -hmm. so with the rise of patreon and youtube and twitch you know someone can you know gaming and the movie industry people go on youtube they do analysis you have podcasts that are all about analysis of this and that and all kinds of things that are basically content they did not create but they are inspired to create content based off of that right but fan fiction i feel like is in this weird spot where you cannot do anything like that so hypothetically if you were to create a patreon and say okay i have these fan fictions because i feel like good writers like have a following and then you make friends but you can't ever capitalize on that like you could with a youtube channel so if you were to open a patreon and say well you can donate to support me you know, how would that, you know, would that hypothetically in print, like, be considered, like, selling? Or would that be okay if it was, you know, based mm -hmm. on the way that you framed your your goals or whatever? So, it's interesting because it would definitely, and again, I'm assuming that, like, we're, I'm assuming a scenario in which it's actually made it to court and then we're on the fair use prong. Um, it would really, it would be a problem for the court. If even if I think if you framed it like, oh, well, I'm just getting donations, and as incidentally as part of that, I'm giving out fan fiction. Like I actually, I know personally fanfic authors who do Patreon, and if you donate them money, they will write a specific fanfic for you. Like you can request a fanfic out of them, um, in, in exchange for money, um, and that is that is a problem. It's like a commercial use, that is a commercial it less use. To be fair use. And it's not it's not the only thing that determines whether it's fair use, but courts take a really, really dim view of people who make money off of this stuff. To the extent where there have been some cases where courts have said, you know, there are ads on your website, and you can get some ad revenue in the order of a few cents per click. We count that as making money. Um, so it can get, which is actually one of the interesting things why AO3 runs without any ads, is like partly specifically in response to this. Um, so it does create some problems, and you know, it's probably not a good idea to try to be a professional fanfic author. Um, yeah, because <laughs> keep in mind, they can see through that. They know what you're doing. They're not stupid. And not only, as Meredith was saying, does that put you into less likely to be able to prove fair use at trial, um, it makes it more likely that you're going to get taken to trial because yeah. they tend to get fussy when they see you making money because they think it should have been theirs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it's more li you're more likely to get sued if you have that up there. I mean, because obviously you're trying to take it one step aside and say, oh, I'm not selling this. I'm getting donations over. And then we it's part of my output doing. I'm you putting out. You know what you're doing. They know what you're doing. They'll see through it. They're more likely to sue you. 
Yeah, it's kind of interesting because I think unless you know, unless you had a situation in which you know, if you donate, you don't get to request what the, you output. Like if it was basically like I am a full time author writing all this other stuff, and then incidentally I'll put out some fanfic once in a while. That could be a little. You could argue that a little more because, like, I, you know, I get paid by my job, and I also incidentally put out some fanfic once yeah. in a while. Like, you know, there is a system where you could argue that, but basically, like, you know, and and sometimes fanfic authors do go on to work for official licensed properties. Like, yeah. one of the most recent Star Wars novelizations was done basically by a fanfic author that they were like You're pretty good, and then they hired her. They used to have um, the Star Trek stuff. Yeah, all the time. People used to send in spec scripts for Star Trek all the time, and so like a lot of the original series is just random people were like, eh, you should do this Tribble episode, and they did it. <laughs> so don't get that as much nowadays. But Most once studios in a while. will not take uh, manuscripts that you submit. They won't take anything. Oh, I sent the studio my my screenplay. Most of them get and returned unopened because they do not want any way that they could have been tainted by something you sent and then you sue them. And that's so the Marion Zimmer Bradley situation. They could get sued by the right. fan you fiction author. Okay. Okay, guys. Um, I made sure that it wasn't written down, and I apologize if Richard Hatch bursts with the door at the ask of this question. But Axanar, um, yes. the question that's been thrown around in the media, but uh, they didn't actually have any court proceedings for us to actually watch, mm. was who owns copyright? Um, because is it CBS? Is it Paramount? Is it somebody else? Um, and just wondering what you guys think, because that's the we, we didn't have court proceedings, so we couldn't answer the question. Right. Uh, so it's interesting because I, I don't know how the, like, the contract of divvying up the rights to that went about. I mean, presumably CBS held it, and then some, there's some kind of web of contracts about who gets to make what out of the Star Trek property. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what that is. Now, the flip side of this, which I actually found really interesting, is, is I guess Paramount released their like, guidelines for fan films after this, which is kind of cool. Um, and it's a best practice, and I'm very happy that they're, like, acknowledging that fan films are going to happen, um, and we might as well, like, give people some nudges to do them in the right direction. Yeah. The problem is their version of guidelines are actually way more restrictive than what the law allows under fair use. Um, so it's one of those things, and it's, you know, actually the open gaming license is also the same thing. You cannot copyright a gaming system. You can copyright the text in the D&D core manual, but you cannot copyright the system of your stats and rolling d20 to do it. That's function. Um, that's, that's process. Functional. That's not copyright. And so the open gaming license is basically attempting to stick a contract on something you can't copyright anyway. Um, and I say this as a person who have a lot of friends who are game designers, and I fight with them about this all the time. Um, I am not fun at parties, so I'll just put that out there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's an interesting case. I don't know because, again, we haven't had court proceedings, and so I've really just been following what's been coming through the docket. I got a quick question. It's a little bit different. Like with cosplay or costumes for like dogs and cats, how does that follow underneath the cosplaying? Same rules. Same rules? Okay. Very cute. So, um, <laughs> That's a fair use cuteness exception. Off the dogs yeah. More. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't. It's, it's kind of funny though. I don't know. I never thought about that. Like, yeah, did you I mean, ever make a Yoda dog costume on the set of Star Wars? I don't think so. Like, <laughs> I mean, because again, it would be a lot less similar to the original thing, and so... Mm -hmm. You, you know. could also claim it's a parody. Yeah. I'm parodying Yoda by dressing up my ugly yeah. chihuahua. Like. Which is mm -hmm. just another fair use. Yeah, because so. I've, I've heard other people say, well, if you say inspired by, that, that kind of... Yeah. 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 I wonder. You, you can't get That's away like saying, from I don't know like the copyright, no copyright Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. It's the same. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I didn't uh, mean to infringe. Oh, yeah. Oops. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't own these copyrights. No, you don't, but someone does. You know, it, it, none of those things work. It's right. a neat idea. There's a, there, one of the things that keeps coming up is um, the poor man's copyright. How many of y'all actually heard this? You mail your thing to yourself. It doesn't work. <laughs> don't do that. Um, <laughs> pay the 35 bucks and register it, but putting your manuscript in an envelope and mailing it to yourself does not give you any protection. Um, that's just one of those myths that's out there, writing no intention, you know, no intentional infliction of infringement or something. That doesn't help either. The, there's no magic words. There's no magic words, and nothing you read on Facebook is going to really help. <laughs> yeah. Don't trust Facebook. Absolutely. Ever. Okay. Yeah, we're a little over time, so I okay, think I need to wrap it up. Yep, well, well I'm going to be kicking around here, so if you guys have any other questions, feel free to come up and ask, and thanks for coming out. Thanks much.